Life community, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. As you can see, it's a youth takeover weekend, so you're gonna see a lot of kids doing work around here. And if you're a teen at home, take over now. And now it's time for worship, so we're gonna hand it over to our youth band. Oh. Well, good morning, Life Community. We are so glad you guys are here this morning. Um, as you can see, like you said, it's a youth takeover weekend. So if you don't know me, my name is Alyssa, and um, I'm our youth worship leader here. Uh, and this is our youth band, plus a couple old guys who snuck in, but I didn't really have a choice. He's my boss, okay? <laughs> Um, but we're, we're so pumped to um, worship with you guys today. These kids have been working so hard all week. Um, and so if you would please stand with us, we're going to start with a couple of songs. Feel free to sing along, clap along, raise your hands. Um, and we're just excited to worship with you this morning. <laughs>
sent his son for us to die on a cross 
that he washed our sins away. So this is just the time that, that I, would, I would love for you to have your own personal time with Jesus and just thank him for everything that he's done for you. So our ushers, as they hand you the elements, you don't have to be a member here to take communion with us. Even if this is your first time, you're more than welcome. But also if it makes you uncomfortable, feel free to just let it pass. And, and as we sing this next song, I would just love for you to reflect and, and, and take a moment and just listen to the words and um, sing along and just remember everything that God has done for us.
What a beautiful song. Such a good song. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily, and I am a youth leader here at uh, Life Community. On Wednesday nights, I get to hang out with the middle school and high school kids, and uh, we just get to praise God together. And it's awesome when when we get together. Our goal is to always share the gospel. That's that's our goal with the kids, and there's no better way to share the gospel than with communion together. And so today we get to do communion. We get to think about our daily sins. And while I was going through the study, I found I came across John 6, and Jesus told his disciples something that was kind of cool and worth sharing. And uh, Jesus said, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread from heaven that you may not die. I am the bread of life. And in essence, Jesus is like, I'm making a radical change. I'm making a change in how you guys see the world and how you see God and how you see sin. And, and I think that he wants that radical change in us right now too. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread. In the same way, Jesus takes the cup and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your constant redemption in our daily mistakes and your amazing love and that amazing grace that, that we so do not deserve, and yet you love us anyway, that you died on that cross for us. You forgive us. We, we just are in awe of you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now we get to celebrate with a song. So they're gonna, as they collect your cups right now, you can just throw them in the baskets that are coming around. But um, so it wouldn't be a complete youth takeover unless we did a song from youth that you guys might not know. So yes, we are gonna celebrate, but we're gonna do it how we do it in youth. Um, so if you guys, uh, you youth kids in the room, I better hear you singing real loud. <laughs> so everyone else, it's a simple song. It's called You Have Set Me Free, and I love how it ties with communion. So we're going to teach it to you. The words are on the screen. Sing along.
Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We can never repay you, and we don't deserve it, but we, we love you for everything that you've done for us, God. So we thank you, and we worship you this morning. And in your name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. Um, you can have a seat. Kids, you are dismissed. And um, you can head out to your classes and middle schoolers meet Jason by the front door. And if you're watching online, um, right now would be a great time for you kids to go to our kids page and check out some of our resources for you guys. And everybody else, you guys can check out this video. Hey guys, I'm so glad that we had a chance to worship together. Whether you're at home or you're in the building, before we move on to the message, I have just a few announcements. The first is that this year, July 4th lands on a Saturday. And since we normally have Saturday services, what we've decided to do is we're not gonna have our Saturday service and we want you to spend time with your family. Now, if you normally come on Saturdays, we'd love for you to join us then on Sunday the 5th. Also, um, Downtown Vineyard Church is hosting a multi-church, multicultural worship event on July 5th. It's gonna be at the Old County Courthouse. And so you can find out more info about that on our website. But let me encourage you, in a time where so much is dividing us as a nation, we have a chance to come together with other people in the valley and come uh, worship the one who unites us all. And so again, that's on the 5th. We would love for you to join us there. Also on the 5th, our adventure group is gonna have a night hike. It's gonna be up on the Mesa, and you can find info for that on our website as well. The last thing, around here we have a blue card. If you're in the building, you'll see these near you. Um, if you have a prayer request, or if you wanna sign up for any of our ministry opportunities, you can fill this out and you can drop it in the black giving box that's in the back of the auditorium. If you're at home, you can go to lifegj.org slash blue card and do exactly the same thing. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Tim for the message. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, morning? Good to see you. Welcome to Life Community and uh, welcome church family joining us online. Um, if you have your Bibles close to you, uh, once you grab them, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 19 in just a minute. If you don't, that's fine. It'll be on the screen as well. And uh, let, me, let me just make an observation and set this up and then we'll get to what we're talking about. Have you ever noticed uh, there's this old song I remember as a kid. I want to be his hands, want to be his feet. Anybody remember that song? No, I'm the only one. Okay. <clears throat> Either you're... Nobody remembers that song? Okay. We have one, two. So that's how you know. If you listen to Christian rock music in the 90s exclusively, you'd know that song. So uh, there you go. Anyway, uh, but we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. And there's this idea, and this, if you grew up in church or, you know, if you're just checking out God, Church, and the Bible, we're so glad you're here. Uh, maybe this will be kind of new to you. Um, but it, there's this idea to those, if you grew up in church, if you grew up around faith, you know that we as followers of Jesus are so, supposed to represent him here on this earth, right? That's not new information for anybody, is it? Nobody's like, whoa, mind blown this morning. No, it's not new information. You know that. Now, have you noticed how there's a real disconnect, though, between what we know um, is true, and we'd all go, yeah, that, yeah, that sounds right, that's, that's right, I know that, and then what we actually many times observe either lived out in our own lives or in lives of those we know around us. It's a lot harder to live that out, isn't it? It's a lot harder to, um, to see that, that representation actually um, show itself in our, in our culture, show ourselves in our relationships, isn't it? 
And that's what I want to talk about today as we move through this, and we're going to kind of take some bunny trails and stuff. But really what I want to zero in on and just ask you the question is, how are you doing being Jesus representative? How are you doing in this, in this time uh, of our, our nation where everything is so, so incredibly um, tense, right? How are you doing? How are you doing being his representation in your relationships and your family? Um, now that you've probably spent more time in close proximity with your family than you have in your whole life, right? How are you doing with that? How are you doing being his representative in your relationships, in, your, in the place that you work, in your circle of influence? Because, you know, we have a saying around here. It's one of our, our, our main values, and uh, that's literally my circle, my responsibility. And that's what we believe. Every one of us is placed, God has strategically placed us in a, in a spot in life where he wants us to influence those around us. My circle, my responsibility. How you doing representing him in your circle of influence? All right, so grab your Bibles. Just a second, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 19, but I need to set it up really quick. And to do that, I want to remind you, I've been reminding you as we go through this book, that um, Exodus is part two in the first five parts of a 66 part epic series, okay? And so to understand where we're at in here, there's so much that uh, really helps if you have the context of, of what is happening in the scripture. And if you don't, you're not going to understand it like an original hearer would who lives there in the context, right? And who understands the culture and society. So a couple weeks ago, we went way into the weeds and looked at Genesis 6, one of the weirdest passages in scripture, and showed how that's actually really important in the, uh, in the, in the overarching account of what God's doing um, throughout the Exodus and then as he brings his people into the promised land. And so um, today, I just want to remind you how this whole thing, how the people of Israel, how this redemption got started. And that is right after the Tower of Babel, which is this account in the scripture of um, this time where basically humanity raises its fist at God and says, we want to storm heaven. We don't want to serve God. We want to, we think we can rule God. We think we can, we think we can attack and storm God. We're going to not do what God says when he told us to spread out throughout the earth. We're going to congregate right here and we're going to build this temple that worships a false god, and we're going to storm, we're going to raise our fist against heaven. So Babel, and uh, that's when God confuses the languages, and, and there's this really interesting table of nations, this chart in Genesis chapter 10. It's the table of nations, and it's all these different nations that came from the result of God scattering and dispersing the languages and scattering the people out from Babel. And there's this interesting thing that happens here, and you see this and put the connections together in Deuteronomy, a few, few books down the road here. And that is that basically at Babel, what we're told happens is in a sense, God says to all these scattered nations, all right, you want to go worship false gods? I'm going to let you go down that route where your heart is, and we're going to see how that works out for you. But my heart is still for you. And so I am going to come for you, but I'm going to do that because I'm going to raise up a special, unique people who's going to represent me to this world. And right after the, the Babel account, what you see, um, the very next thing you see is God shows up and speaks to this man named Abraham. He's actually, God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And he says, you're going to be, you're barren right now. Your wife, you're, you, you guys are elderly and barren. You've never had kids, but you're going to be the father of a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. And through Abraham, he tells him that all the nations of the earth will be blessed by you. Like through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In other words, I am picking you, Abraham, and I'm going to raise you up and make you into a great nation. But the purpose isn't just for you and your nation. The purpose is that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so after this, we know this little family tree grows and Abraham has a son named Isaac and Isaac has two sons. And one of them is uh, Jacob and the other is Esau. And then Jacob has 12 sons, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons. I'm not going to name them all off. I don't know if I could do that by memory right now. I'll just, just, you know, somebody in there can. You're nerdier than me. Anyway, nobody's going to volunteer to come up on stage. 
Um, so anyway, Jacob has 12 sons, and this, this promise begins to be fulfilled as God begins to turn them into a large family, and then they go down to Egypt. And the interesting thing is they become enslaved, but Egypt actually becomes an incubator of a nation, because as opposed to the nations um, that they came out of in the Canaan, uh, which is up in modern-day Israel area, as opposed to that area where they would have intermarried with all these tribes who worship false gods and had all this weirdness that we talked about a couple weeks uh, ago going on up there. In, uh, instead of that, they go down to Egypt, and Egypt thought that shepherds, which the people of Israel, this fa big family, they thought that shepherds were detestable. And so nobody would intermarry with these guys. In fact, Egypt thought we are the one pure bloodline. And so God uses even this, this harsh situation. He lands them in a really good spot, and then he grows and he incubates this nation to the point where, uh, as we see in Scripture, when God finally delivers them out of slavery, there's um, over a million, pr probably a couple million people. It's a huge people group. That's why they, um, Pharaoh oppressed them because they were so numerous that he began to be worried that they were going to basically take over the nation. And so God has, is in the process of fulfilling this promise to Abraham that through you, that I'm going to turn you into a great nation. And then he delivers his people. He rescues them. He judges Egypt in, in the meantime. In fact, let's just go ahead and um, pick it up there because God brings them through. If you, if you remember, he brings them out of Egypt the plagues happen on Egypt, right? Um, it, judging, specifically judging the gods, the false gods that Egypt worships. And then he brings them, rescues them through the Red Sea and destroys the army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea as well. So this incredible account, and that's where we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. And it says this, On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim and entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Now, this is so cool. Like, we're getting, getting, getting to some really cool stuff. The next chapter is the giving of the Ten Commandments, and that's a pretty epic portion of Scripture. And so a lot of people, this is kind of like flyover zone. We're just going to skim past this. But I want to zero in actually on just the first six verses of this chapter here today, and then we're going to go some other directions too, because it's so important to the overall story of what God is doing, not just in ancient Israel, but what God is doing in your life and in my life and what God wants to do through us. And so the first thing I want to point out is like, if this were a movie, this would be an epic soundtrack right here. I mean, this is like, oh yeah, third day, first day, third month, whatever, whatever. They came out to the desert, you know, and when we read it, we just skim by it. But what you don't understand is how epic this moment is. Like, this would be, I don't know, the Braveheart moment where they're coming over the hill back into Scotland, you know, and it's got the violins and, and you know, that whole feeling, the drums, da 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 right? You got that moment in your head? Right there with you. Right there with me. Excellent. At least the front row is, so. So, this is that moment, and here's why is because this is an incredible promise fulfilled right here in these first couple of verses. Um, you remember back in Exodus chapter 3? Moses, when, when God asked Moses, or rather instructs Moses, to lead the people, Moses isn't too thrilled about the idea. You remember that? He tries to get out of it. He tries to tell God why he is not the man for the job. Multiple times he tries to get out of it. And God won't let him out of it because God knows what he's raised him up to be and the job he's raised him up to do. And the fact that it's not about Moses, that when God calls you to do something, it's him who's going to equip you to do it. It's not about the fact that you're some amazing person, right? It's about the fact that he wants to accomplish something through you. And so God, as Moses is arguing about this whole thing, God tells Moses, hey, I will be with you. Don't worry, I'm going with you, okay? Hey, man, it's not about you. I'm with you. And this will be the sign. This is Exodus 3.12. This will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Listen up here. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. See, this is the place. This is why it's so epic. 
they're returning to the desert of Sinai and they camp in front of this mountain. And this is the mountain where God appears to, to Moses in a burning bush. And God commissions him as, as a leader. And God tells him, I've got a plan for you and I've got a plan for this people. And I've got a plan for what I want to accomplish here. This is that moment that he sees like, whoa, God kept his promise. God has been with me. God's been with me this whole time. And Moses, in this moment, I think it's so cool, as, as he's writing this down, he's like, man, I <laughs> write down the day and write down the month on the first day of the third month. Write this down. Because this is the moment God is coming through. This is amazing. <laughs> I didn't know how this was going to happen. You know, if I'm honest, I don't even know that I had the faith that this was going to happen. But now here I am with this giant people group, and we're camped out at the base of this mountain, and we're going to worship God here. Da -da -da -da. You hear the epic strings. Okay. So this is an epic moment. It's epic. And Moses stepped into his calling, which is so important. Even though he was afraid, he obeyed. He took the next step, right? You don't have to. Uh, we say this often, you don't have to see the end of the road and the journey that God's calling you to. All you got to do is take the next step he's calling you to take. That's usually all the information he gives you. You know, maybe he gives you a picture of what it's going to look like way down the road. But he doesn't show you how you're going to get there. He just shows you the next step you're going to take. And so Moses takes the next step and he obeys God. And now here he is enjoying this place of seeing God's promise fulfilled. And when he steps into the calling and the thing that God asks him to do, it impacts lives around him. He's now there with this people that's been freed from slavery, that's been freed from oppression. And he looks over and he goes, man, I am so glad that I said yes to the thing that God was calling me to do. And see, for you and me, here, here's the truth is you, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of you saying yes to the thing that God is asking you to do. You just don't. And, and a lot of times it just feels like such a small thing. You know, just being faithful in this season as a, as a husband, as a father, as, as a mom, you know, or a wife, and just, you know, going through the motions, changing another diaper, you know. Um, a lot of times it feels mundane, Sometimes it feels just kind of insignificant, and God just whispers in your ear, I want you to go, go talk to that neighbor, check in on him. You know, ah, I'm busy. But then, you know, it's like, all right, you just know you're supposed to, so you do, and then there's some big deal going in, on in their life. You get to pray with them. You get to speak into their life. You have no idea what hangs in the balance and how the small decision of actually doing the thing, taking the step that God's calling you to take, actually the impact it might make on lives around you. And Moses is here in the situation now with this huge group of people who have been set free. And Moses has played such a critical role in that. It's so cool to see. It's so epic. All right. So 19, verse 3. Then Moses, so they're camped out. They're there. They're in this spot. God's fulfilled his promise. And Moses goes up to see what God would say to the people. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. I want you to catch this. Go down. This isn't, this isn't just about you. This is a big picture thing, Moses. And so here's the message I want you to communicate. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. See, Two aspects of God's care for us and his care for his people right there. You saw what I did to Egypt, the way that I really stepped in. And, and man, my power was so evident through the plagues, through the Red Sea. I rescued you from your enemies in a very literal sense. I freed you. I rescued you. You've seen that. You've seen my power on display. But have you noticed how I cared for you? how I provided this amazing, yummy, frosted, flaky stuff called manna that's out there every morning for you, like miraculously providing for you, caring for you, how I provided for you for water and all this I've been caring for you. And so you see these two things, because honestly, if God is just powerful, you might be afraid of him. But if God is just powerful and he doesn't care for us, 
Man, that's not a good place to be, is it? And if God is just cares for us, but he doesn't have the power to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, that's not a very good place to be in either, is it? And see, God says, I want you to realize how powerful I am and the fact that I have just loving care for you. And it's this beautiful picture. I've carried you on eagle's wings like an eagle protecting her young chicks, right? I care for you. And this one sometimes is harder for us, isn't it? Because life throws so many things at us. I think it's easier to believe that God is there, that he's powerful, than it sometimes is to believe that he cares individually for us. That he really, truly cares for you. He cares for you. He sees you. Jesus says he knows the number of hair on your head. And as I often say, that's a lot harder for some of you than for others, right? But it's no, no problem for him. He knows you. He knows your needs before you even ask him, and yet he invites you to bring your needs to him and ask because he wants to be involved in your life in an intimate way. He cares for you. All right. So he says, I cared for you. I'm powerful, and I cared for you. Now, here's what he says now. Um, now, if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is incredible. It's just incredible what God wants to do. And see, here's, here's how this plays in, because you remember the promise to Abraham, right? That through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then God raises them up, and, and God blesses his people and raises them up, and now he's rescued and redeemed them. And now he is about ready to communicate to his people uh, corporately their purpose. Like, you have a mission. You have a purpose. Like, I'm not just bringing you out so that you can, you know, enjoy fellowship with me and enjoy this new land, the promised land. That's part of it. I am for your joy. I am for your fulfillment. I, I am for those things. But you have a bigger purpose. If you, if you get out of whack, here, here's what I want you to do. You, you are going to be my treasured possession. And, and in the Hebrew, there's this idea of, of someone who serves another and is just treasured. Something that's just treasured, he says. And the whole earth is mine. Like, I could have picked any, any of the nations but in this time where they're just decided to walk away from me, I decided I want to raise up you as my people in order to reach out to them, in order to reach them. And so because of that, you'll be for me a kingdom of priests. What are priests? Priests are people who represent God to others, right? Kind of a mediator between God and others. And he says, you're going to be like a whole kingdom. Like your whole, the purpose of your whole people is that, you know, to the nations, you're going to be like priests. You're going to be the ones who bring the message of God and help them connect with God and help them meet God and lead them into how to worship and to how to know the one true God. Because I want to bless them too. And the way they're living is not the way that brings life. Not the way I intended for people who were created in my image to live. And so I want to use you. You're going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. You're going to be set apart. You're going to be different. And we're going to have, you know, next, next chapter, he's going to introduce the law, the Ten Commandments, which is kind of like chapter headings for the rest of the 613 commandments that will go over the next 59 chapters before they move on. They're at Sinai for like a whole year, right? And he's going to introduce these family rules for them. And, and the purpose is, a holy nation, the purpose is, you know, there's going to be some ceremonial things that are going to help you understand how awesome and how great and how other than nature and other than human God is. You know, you're not going to have any images because there's no image that can represent the one true God. 
I'm just too big. I'm too powerful, right? Um, There's going to be some ceremonial things that that remind you of Eden and perfection, right? And what God's heart is and his intention. And the fact that there's a holy space, there's going to be some things that remind you. Then there's going to be a whole bunch of things that feel kind of random. But you know what? They're there for your health, for your thriving, for your fulfillment. And, you know, the two big ones, love God and love others. There's going to be a whole bunch of stuff about how to be loving towards others, how to have a just civil society, how to have a society that thrives. And the reason for that is when other nations look at you, I want them to go, wow, who's God? Who's their God? See, because nations believe that that, um, each geographical area had its own God at this time. God says, no, the whole earth is mine, although there's these other spiritual beings that are oppressing people in these different areas. The whole earth is mine, and there's only one God. And I want other people to look at you and go, wow, whose God is that? And say, I want that. I want to serve. I want to worship that God. Because look at how that nation thrives. Look at how well they get along with each other. Look at how just it is. Look at the fact that, you know, the legal system isn't skewed towards either the rich or the poor. That came out of these next 59 chapters. That there's justice for all. That there's truly a sense of justice. Look at the way that, man, they're blessed by God. Look, they they take a day off every week. They, they give of their resources to meet the needs of both, you know, the priests and the whole religious system, but also the poor. And look at how blessed the nation is. And even though they don't work, God somehow comes through for them. Even though they don't work on the seventh day, they rest. They get to rest. They take a day off. We don't get to take a day off. I want that. I want that. See, all these laws that he are about, are, is about to give them is related to this. He says, here's, here's what I need you to do, though. I need you to trust me. I need you to keep my covenant. And when you hear that, um, we can think forward to the covenant that he's about ready to give them at Sinai. But here's what you have to understand. That covenant is not a brand new thing. That's just an extension of a relationship that's already began. And this is an important conversation for us as followers of Jesus. See, in Abraham, there's a covenant here, right? And the covenant, basically what God asked of Abraham was believing loyalty. He wanted Abraham to believe in him and be loyal to him and not worship a bunch of other gods. So there was a mark in the flesh that Abraham and his uh, descendants had to do as a sign of that believing loyalty, right? Circumcision, the, the covenant of circumcision. So there's things that Abraham does as an indication that his heart is believing and loyal towards God. And so what's about ready to come next in the law is, is the outworking of that. Now that you're in relationship, you remember the Passover happens. God saves them. He redeems them. He says, I, I need you just to trust me. I need you to trust me in the Passover. I need you to, you know, put the blood of the lamb on the top and the side of the door. And then, you know, you go under that as a symbol of walking under the blood, all this picture of what Jesus would do for us, what we just celebrated in communion. And, and really what that is, is it's just a symbol that you, you believe and you have loyalty to me and you trust me. See, the, there's this false idea around that somehow the Old Testament people earned their way into favor with God because they did good works. And in the New Testament, um, you know, now we have grace. But in the Old Testament, it was just they, wor- they worked. That's not true. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The people of Israel, God rescued them. He saved them. He redeemed them. He invited them into relationship before he ever gave them all the family rules. You see, the, the rules, the law, was how that worked itself out in their lives. Now that I've redeemed you, now that I've saved you, now that we're in relationship, here's how we're going to live in order to be a holy nation so that in a kingdom of priests, so that all the other nations will look at your lives and go, wow, I want some of that. See, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. And see, it happens. It starts working itself out already in this point. Like this whole idea of kingdom of priests. Like in Moses, last week we focused on leadership in the story of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, right? But it's really cool. And there's a little bunny trail. But I think it's worth taking because it illustrates this. In uh, verse um, 7, 
In verse 7, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he brings his family back to Moses as they're camped out there um, in the desert. And it says, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him, a symbol of uh, reverence. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all about the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. This is so cool. Have you ever had like been in a position where maybe, um, you know, if you've ever led something, you know, there's like people around you that you just feel safe, just like unloading your heart to. And this is what Moses' father-in-law is to him. And I love it. It's this great relationship. And so he just, man, he just shares what God had done. He just opens his mouth. Now, here's what you need to know. Mid, um, Jethro is the priest of Midian. He offers sacrifices to false gods. And yet Moses is here just telling him, hey, this is what God did. And, and Jethro's like, whoa, that's so awesome. And sometimes all you got to do is just open your mouth and share what God's done in your life. You know that? I mean, we make sharing our faith sometimes so intimidating. And really it's like, it's just sharing the story of what God's done in your life. Sharing what he's done, how he set you free in an area. It's just offering that comfort and the hope of, you know, man, when something bad happens and you don't know the, the way out of it, you know, maybe a health scare or something, and you're having that conversation with your coworker or friend, it, it's even, it's that thing of going, yeah, nah, yeah this, is, this, this is, is bad, but man, I know God's good and I, I know he's got this. And they see this faith working itself out in your life. And Moses just opens his mouth and just shares, like, wow, this is what God did. And here, here's what happens. Verse 9, Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know the Lord is greater. Get this. This is the priest of the other gods. And just Moses' obedience of stepping into this calling and the way that God has moved and then him having the courage just to open his mouth and share what God has done. Here, here's the, this is Jethro, I believe this is Jethro's conversion moment. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. Isn't that cool? This is the moment where Moses steps into his calling and then he shares and all of a sudden this whole idea of being a kingdom, go back to 19, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. This is where that shows itself. It's already coming to pass just because of God's activity. Because Moses says yes, he steps through. God shows up in an incredible way. And people see the goodness of God. And you see this pattern all over. It's always been about the nations. All over. You see this with Rahab, the prostitute. In Joshua. You see this with Ruth, a Gentile, who, who, who comes to worship the true God. You see this with Naaman, a, a general of a foreign enemy. And he, he has an encounter with God and, you know, through his time in Israel that's so powerful that he says, I'm going to actually bring some dirt back from Israel. Because remember, in this time in history, they believed that, you know, gods were geographical. So he's like, can I bring some dirt back so that when I go back, I can worship your God? He has this incredibly powerful encounter with God. And see, here's where this, this whole kingdom of priests thing and a holy nation. This is God saying, this is my heart for you because I have a heart for the world and I want you to be my, my chosen instrument for reaching the world. Not because there's anything special about you other than the fact that I picked you. But it's about what I want to do through you. It's about what I want to accomplish through you, through your life. What I want to do in your life. Now, this whole idea, Israel has a very patchy record of actually seeing this come to pass. If you know the, the, the ongoing story of, of Scripture, um, they have some, some really brilliant moments. 
God builds him into actually a big kingdom. He takes him into the promised land. He fulfills his promise. But man, just, just like weeks later, after, after this account, they're going to be making a golden calf and worshiping it. And this is kind of the repeated pattern throughout the Old Testament is um, Israel kind of saying, I'm gonna, we're going to worship God and we're going to serve God. And then their hearts being drawn away to worship other false idols. And they con constantly struggle with this idea of believing loyalty that shows itself in obedience to God. Believing loyalty. They constantly struggle with it. Starts really um, where it gets the worst is at the end of Solomon's life where he marries like 700 um, wives, which let me just say for the wisest guy in the world, idiot move, right? Yeah. You may be smart, does not exempt you. Don't think that just because of the fact you're smarter than others, you're going to somehow uh, get out of the consequences of your sin, okay? That's a good thing to remember. Uh, that's another message. But they begin to abandon God and turn to false idols over and over again, a whole string of wicked kings. The ten, nation, the ten tribes to the north are hauled off into exile. Before you know it, Judah's hauled off into exile in Babylon. And, and this is a time of discipline from God, actually. God uses this. And he says, but I still have a heart for this. In fact, in Isaiah, in Isaiah, he says, hey, I know you're in exile, but I, I still, I'm going to bring you back into the land. It's no, not, you know, Isaiah 49, 6. Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, to bring back those of Israel that I have kept? No, God says, I'm going to do that. And then he says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So God says, even though over and over again, you failed at being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, I'm going to raise up a leader. I'm going to come myself to my people. And I'm going to pay for all this sin and I'm going to redeem them. And then I'm going to um, continue this work. And this is as Jesus comes, he's the fulfillment of this, all these messianic prophecies. And Jesus comes and he lives a holy, perfect life. And he defeats Satan both at the temptation and then at the cross where Satan thought, thinks I've got him. It's actually Satan's greatest defeat because three days later, Jesus rises again. He gathers up this little band of his followers and he tells them, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, you go, you go to the ends of the earth. Make disciples, other followers of me. And then, a short time later at Pentecost, this incredible thing happens because he's not going to send his people out in their own strength and in their own power to try to accomplish his mission of reaching the nations. See, this has always been about the nations, right? And so at Pentecost, the morning of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes on them in flames of tongues of fire above their heads, which is brings your mind back to somebody who knows the whole 66 volumes or it's somebody at this point because, you know, those, the, the New Testament volumes weren't, weren't all written yet, right? But they knew the whole Old Testament, the, the arc of the story, and they're like, wow, the Holy Spirit, this is like the pillar of fire in the desert that symbolized God's presence, and the Holy Spirit comes on them. And now, not just like in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit would come on some prophets for a little while and then leave, but the Holy Spirit indwells them and indwells you and indwells me. And then this really cool thing happens at Pentecost too. You remember the table of nations back in Genesis 10? I know this all strings together, right? Stick with me. The table of nations, well, back in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit comes on them, they start speaking in all these different languages. And there's Jews that are flooded in from all these places, all these nations. And there's a list in Acts chapter 2. And guess what? It's all the nations that are listed back in Genesis 10. See, God's coming after those nations. His heart is for them. And those people have the seed of the gospel planted in their hearts. They take it back all over the Greek Roman world at that time. And then they're followed up by missionaries like Peter and Paul. 
and James and a whole bunch of others who we don't even know their names. And it transforms the world. And you and I are here today as a fulfillment of this prophecy, but it, it, it doesn't stop there. See, here's what you got to realize. Peter, famous disciple Peter, he writes a letter to believers of Jesus, primarily Gentiles. We believe in this letter, but Jews and Gentiles, this applies to. And here's what he says, and see if this sounds familiar from what we just read. He says this, but you, speaking to followers of Jesus, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Does that sound familiar? See, what Peter says is, hey, what God started back there all the way in ancient Israel has been his plan all along. And then Paul tells us hey, how this incredible mystery works that it wasn't just about the Jewish people, that Gentiles were grafted in. Aren't you glad? <laughs> that Gentiles are part of the story, included in the people of God. And so he looks at this big group of people that includes you and me and says, you are a holy nation. Another spot, he says, he addresses you as saints. How many of you feel like a saint? I want you to do something. I want you to turn to whoever's next to you and introduce yourself and say, hello, my name is Saint. Go ahead, do that right now. If you're below, introduce yourself to yourself. Feels weird, doesn't it? But Peter would say that's absolutely true. You're a saint. You, you are someone with an incredible calling. Someone, saint, set apart for God. You're supposed to be different. You're supposed to be strange and weird. Not in a bad way, but in a way that draws people to Jesus. You're a, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That he's calling you not to walk in the ways of darkness, not to walk just like the culture around walks, not to get caught up in all the things that the culture around is caught up in. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You've trusted in Jesus. You've come into relationship with him, and that changes you. You don't work your way into salvation. You, you trust in Jesus, and he saves you. And then necessarily that changes you, and it works itself out in your life. You begin to see a process of transformation. Not that you're perfect by any means. Not that you don't have times and weeks and seasons that you stumble and fall down and you, over and over again. And by his grace, he says, that's okay. Get back up. I'll forgive you. I love you. Not that the sin's okay. But I see you through the blood of Jesus, and I'm calling you, and I've given you the Holy Spirit that's going to empower you to live life differently, to be weird in a really good way. He goes on, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. See, here's the thing. If you're part of Jesus' family, if you believe in Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, your primary believing loyalty is to the kingdom of God and to Jesus. Like, that's your citizenship. Paul says it, your citizenship is in heaven. And see, it's so easy, especially in times like, uh, you know, election years and stuff, to get this confused and mixed up in our mind. But our primary allegiance is to Jesus. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. And hey, man, I'm, you know, proud to be an American. I think I want to vote, right? And hold up the standard, you know, that God holds up, that our country was founded on, the principles of justice and all these things and liberty. And yet, and even in the midst of that, my primary loyalty has to be to the kingdom of God and to Jesus. It has to come first, Right? So that what? So that you can be a, a royal priesthood, 
that you can represent Jesus to the nations. You, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. See, too many times we think of sin as something that's just something that uh, is, is bad or something we ought not do. And Peter says, no, 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 actually, those things wage against your soul. And some of you have battled things in your life when it comes to this that you identify with that. You know the feeling of something that you struggle with and wrestle with that's waging against your soul, don't you? And he says, don't do that because you have a higher calling. You have a higher calling on your life. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And Peter remembers what Jesus said, you're salt, you're light in this world. Do such, live your lives in such a way that you are this royal priesthood, that you are this people, that people would see your life and it would be magnetic, that maybe people don't understand like all the stuff you believe and they're like, I don't know about those followers of Jesus. They believe all sorts of stuff. I don't know if I can buy that, you know? A guy rose from the dead. But even, even if they don't know if they believe what you believe, they're like, man, but huh, if I could, I would, I would fill every position in my company with, with followers of Jesus because they're the most honest people I know. Um, they don't, if they've got something to say, they say it to my face. They don't go around slandering me to other people, right? Um, they don't gossip. They don't gossip. Uh, they speak the truth, but when they speak the truth, just like Paul says, let your conversations, when it comes to dealing with people who aren't followers of Jesus and even with each other, be full of grace, seasoned with salt. That they should, there should be, you know, salt's a preservative, right? That they should be full of grace towards each other and yet seasoned with salt, the preservative, the truth as well. That you speak the truth in love, that you're full of grace and truth, just like Jesus. We speak the truth. We uphold the principles of Scripture. All these things. We don't compromise on important issues. We stand up for liberty and justice. We can say, yes, hatred and racism anywhere it exists is absolutely wrong, right? And so is looting and stealing. And you know what the answer is? Repentant hearts turning to Jesus and being transformed. Amen. That's the answer. And you know how, how that happens is when his representatives, you and I, go out into the corners of the world in our circles of influence, and this isn't just a pastor, like guy with the face mic thing. You are the church. You are a royal priesthood. It's not just pastors. You are a holy nation. You are a people who have been called and set apart to show the world, how awesome your God is. Amen. So how are you doing representing him? How are you doing representing Jesus? As Jesus' representative, how are you doing? How's your speech? How's your moral life? How's your generosity? How are you doing when it comes to, to speaking the truth in love? How is your believing loyalty? It, do you see yourself first as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Is there an area where you need to invite the Holy Spirit to work on you a little bit? To change this area in your life? Because you know that if somebody else looks at your life, they're like, oh, I don't see anything different about you. There's nothing magnetic about you. How are you doing in the way you treat your husband or the way you treat your wife and the way you speak about your husband, the way you speak about your wife when they're not around to others? How are you doing in your tone towards your kids? How are you doing towards those people that are just so frustrating on social media? You have any of those friends? Yeah, maybe you need to get off social media for a while. Like until after November, you know. Some, I think if the whole nation did that, we'd probably be better, right? 
But how are you doing? I mean, you've got those coworkers, don't you? That just rub you the wrong way. And come on, they're just so, I won't say it. I'm a pastor. Right? It's like, what, how do you, what are you thinking? How are you doing representing Jesus to them? See, that's the first and primary call that you have. To love God, love others, and the way that that works itself in life is how are you being a holy nation, a royal priesthood, representing Jesus? How are you doing? As Jesus' representative, how are you doing? I think it's worth really praying through that and allowing God to move on your heart and do the stuff he wants to do in you. Would you stand? And as we close in prayer, I just want to give an opportunity for anyone in the room or anyone watching online. You know, we really, we spelled out the gospel and that is that you don't earn your way to God, but that you just embrace what he did for you, what Jesus did for you when he died and rose again. And so if that's you, I want to just, as we close in prayer, I want to give you the opportunity to pray a simple prayer like me. The words aren't important. The important thing is your heart expressing your trust in him and the fact that you want to live your life for him. Let's bow our heads. Father, I just, um, if anyone is in the room or watching, I pray that you would just give them the ability, draw them to yourself. And they can pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned. I want to be in relationship with you. I ask you to forgive my sin. I'll turn my life to you. I repent. I turn from my sin and I want to turn to you. I want to live the rest of my life for you. Forgive me. Welcome me into your family. Thank you so much. And Lord, for all my other friends, I pray that you would just really help them by the power of your Holy Spirit to ask this question as Jesus' representative, how, how am I doing? How am I doing? Is there an area of my life right now that I know I need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform, that I need to cooperate with God in so that I can better represent Jesus to this world? And then I pray you'd give them the courage to allow you to do that work and to cooperate with you and to walk with you. You'd give them the courage to take that next step, to open their mouths in, in situations where they need to, to speak the truth, but to do it in such a loving way that others are drawn to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for being here. We hope you have a fantastic week. I'm going to invite some folks from our ministry team uh, to come up on either side of the stage here. And if you need prayer, uh, would you please not leave without prayer? God bless. Have a great day. And uh, we'll see you next week. Remember.